It may look like a run-of-the-mill dining table, but it has a surprise hidden inside. As always, safety glasses and hearing protection are important considerations in your shop. But we often work alone, and this table gets pretty heavy by the time we're done building it. So you need to be a little bit thoughtful and careful when manipulating and working with these heavy weights. Take the time and be thoughtful about how you're lifting and how you're moving things to escape injuring your back or dropping things on your feet while you're working with some fairly heavy weights. As always, your best safety device is up here. You are your own best protection. Many dining room tables have a two-part top that slide open that you can put a leaf in to make a bigger table. But this one actually stores the leaf inside the table. It's called a butterfly leaf table. And you no longer have to worry about where to store the leaf when it's not in use. It stores inside the table, hidden from view and out of the way. In addition to the folding leaf, there are a few interesting design details on this table. The table slides are actually built as part of the apron, and a butterfly spline holds the breadboard ends on, rather than a traditional tongue and groove joint. Here in episode 7, we're going to build the frame for our dining table. Now, we're going to cover the design of this, because a mechanical table like this one requires a, a number of design considerations that aren't present in a standard fixed top table. And we'll talk about that as we start. But then I'll show you how to make the two leg subassemblies, the stretcher that goes between them, and then the apron sides are actually part of the slide mechanism that will allow the top to open and close. And they're connected by these two stretchers in between that will not only keep these from racking, but also provide those, the support points, the pivot points, for the butterfly leaf that we'll create in episode 8. We'll do the tops and the butterfly leaf in episode 8, but this is more than enough to keep us busy for one episode. So let's get started. I do get a lot of questions about the process of designing a project. Although some of the initial work was done in my 2D CAD program, I wanted to do the design work in a 3D modeling program. This makes visualizing the project easier and helps ensure that moving parts will work together. I'm using Sketchlist 3D Pro. Working in Sketchlist mirrors the way I work in the shop. I start by creating a blank using the dimensions needed. Pick the grain direction, choose the species of wood, and select solid lumber or sheet goods. This is the blank for the foot. By selecting the blank and then the shape command, Sketchlist allows me to lay out and cut away the parts from the blank just as I will in the shop. This is a very different approach from typical 3D modeling programs where you start by drawing the final profile in 2D and extrude it into a 3D part. I find that because the software works the way I will be in the shop, I have a better feel for the parts that I'm actually drawing. And the process continues beyond just shaping the part. Sketchlist allows you to open a variety of dialog boxes for making mortises, adding tenons, creating profiles, whatever it is that you need to do to the part you're working on. With the table foot complete, all the other parts can be created in the same way and added to the assembly. The legs can be specified and the tenons added on, the top stretcher, the slats in between, the rails, 
the upper stretchers, all can be created and added to our existing assembly as we go. Any part only needs to be made once and then copied and placed when more than one is required, including being able to copy and set entire sub-assemblies like the leg set. This type of 3D modeling allows me to figure out what's going to work and what won't work before any wood is actually cut. With the table design settled on, before I actually start cutting parts, I wanted to make a full-scale mock-up of the way that the leaf mechanism was going to work. And I did this to prove the concept because the leaf system gets added toward the very end of the build, and that would be a terrible time to figure out that the apron pieces needed to be a little bit wider apart. So this represents the tabletop. There's the apron pieces that are at the proper distance from each other, and the stretcher going between that holds the pivot point. I didn't bother to make the leaves in full scale. They're only an inch and a half wide because the width doesn't really matter at this point. It's this part of the mechanism that we're worried about. And as you can see, it works exactly the way I want it to. Everything fits, everything folds, everything works. Now, if you're going to be making your own version of the table and you're going to follow my instructions exactly, you don't need to take this step. I've already done it for you and the pivot point is a given known commodity. But if you're going to make your own butterfly leaf table and change the dimensions, then by all means, I highly recommend that you do a mock-up like this in order to prove the concept and your pivot point or else you're going to run into trouble. The two feet and the four legs all end up at two inches thick. I'm using all five quarter material and just did the glue ups needed to make the legs and the feet. Then these glued up blanks went through the typical process of jointing, planing, ripping, and cross cutting to final size. I processed the legs and the feet together so that they'd be exactly the same thickness. A lot of lumber went into this table and the chairs that go with it. And I can't stress enough that having a good relationship with your lumber suppliers is a huge help. My supplier, Advantage Trim and Lumber, is an hour and a half away, so I often don't get to choose my own boards. But they've always selected excellent stock for me. And when I bought the lumber for my tables and chairs, they made sure that all of my five-quarter lumber was on the plump side. Once the glue-ups were milled to size, the feet were then laid out for shaping. The top corner bevels were marked out four inches by one inch, and the center of the bottom was marked out that'll create the pads on both ends of the feet. The feet were then rough-shaped on the bandsaw staying close to the lines, and cleaned up using a variety of hand tools, including planes and rasps, the same way they were laid out in the sketch list program. The top of the foot gets mortises for the legs and the slats, and a mortise along one face to accept the stretcher. A tenon is needed on both ends of each leg one quarter deep by three quarters wide on all four faces. A well set up miter gauge like my Osborne EB3 ensures that the shoulders line up square. Now just as the foot got three mortises to accept all the parts, the top stretcher needs the same three mortises in the same place. Now if you have a mortising machine, these can be pretty accurate. I don't happen to have one, so I drill them out and then hand chisel them, as you've seen. But this means that they're all going to be just a little bit different. So to account for that, I make my tenons just a whisker oversized. And I'll use a shoulder plane to remove just a little bit of material from each side until I get the fit I want. 
this not only allows me to get a perfect fit on every mortise and tenon joint, but it also allows me to ensure that when these two two inch wide pieces go together, they will flush out. I can remove a little bit more from one side or the other as needed to flush everything out and to make it work the way I want. A little bit of handwork, but well worth the effort to get a truly tight fitting joint. Here's a pro tip for you. When I'm hand fitting my mortises and tenons, you'll see me mark the face of the tenon with a pencil prior to shaving it with my shoulder plane. This gives me a visual reference that helps me ensure that I'm removing material evenly across the tenon. The area being cut is always smaller than the plane, and without this reference, it's all too easy to shave your tenons out of square. Before gluing up the leg subassemblies, the top rails need a pair of pocket holes to attach the apron sides with. The apron will be profiled to be part of the top slide mechanism. So I set my Craig jig to 7 eighths of an inch rather than 3 quarter because the apron will be thinner where the screws are attached. Before assembly, all the pieces need to get sanded. But you need to be careful not to round over any of the edges during this step. The legs and the feet go together flush on the outside faces. So if you round over any of the edges, you're going to get an unsightly joint. After the subassemblies are completed, all of the sharp edges can be sanded and cleaned up. Personally, I like the look of a crisp edge, so mine will get hand sanded, breaking the edges as little as possible. Now the leg subassemblies can be built. Glue is applied for the mortise and tenon joints on the legs, but the slats go in with no glue. Note how I'm checking the ends of the legs before I put things together. I marked all of the joints as I fitted them, so I could ensure the correct mortises and tenons went together. A call is used during clamping between the foot and the clamps. Because I want the clamps aligned with the legs, but the leg meets the foot, in line with the bottom notch of the foot. The square shoulders on the tenons and my Bessie parallel clamps keep everything aligned as the pressure is applied. The individual slats are trapped within mortises, but still loose. Tapered plugs will lock them in place and fill the gaps between the slats. The plugs are made from half inch stock ripped one inch wide with a 10 degree bevel along each edge. Then cross cut into one inch lengths also with a 10 degree bevel. Note the sequence of the cross cutting here. In order for the plug to be tapered properly on all four sides, the end is bevel cut with the wide part of the stock on the table, flipped over and cut to length, then flipped back to bevel the end of the stock again. Tapering the plugs takes a little more time and attention, but makes it possible to fully seat the plugs between the slats. The sharp edge at the top of the taper gets compressed between the existing parts, leaving no gaps that will need to be filled. With the leg subassemblies complete, we can move on with assembling the table base. Next we'll create the stretcher that connects the two legs of our table at the feet. This part is milled out to two and three quarters wide, an inch thick, and then cross cut to 39 inches long. A tenon is then milled into each end. The cheek cuts on our tenons are a quarter inch deep by one inch wide. 
but the shoulders are cut a half inch deep. This is so that they'll clear the slat mortise that's already in the feet of the table. And as always, I make the tenon a little bit too thick and then shave it down to get a perfect fit. One of the major design challenges for this particular table was the mechanism that would allow the tops to open and close, either accepting the leaf or hiding it. Now, there are many methods for doing this, and my research showed me several, but I chose something a little bit unique. I decided that the slide should actually be part of the apron rather than internal to the table. And so I've created a two-piece apron section that allows for the piece to slide open and close. The tabletop will be attached to this outer part and the inner part will be actually the apron of the table itself, part of the structure. And this simplifies things a great deal. We don't have to worry about the slide mechanism interfering with our butterfly opening. It simplifies the more complex part of the project. And all it requires is that we do a little bit of precision milling to make these two parts so that they work properly with each other. Not that hard to do, and I'll show you how it's done as we progress. The easy way to do this is to print out the full-scale slide template included in the plans and glue the positive section of it to the end of your slide stock. This makes it very easy to set up the various machines. We start by removing most of the waste around the profile using a dado blade at the table saw. The entire profile could be milled at the router table, but by minimizing the amount of cutting that the router bit has to do, you reduce the number of setups, increase the lifespan of expensive router bits, and reduce the opportunity for tear out, improving the quality of the final cut. A drawer lock bit is mounted in the router table and set up so that it'll cut the profile drawing just at the lines along the bottom. Mill this initial setup into both edges of both apron slide pieces. Selecting clean, tight grained material with no defects will go a long way toward helping your slides work the way you want them to. Now, without moving the fence, the router bit is raised up until it meets the top of the profile line. And then all four edges are run again at this new setting to complete the slide profile. In order for these slides to work properly, the milling has to be straight and true all the way along. A good set of push blocks, like these grippers from Microjig, allow you to keep the pressure directly over the bit during the cutting and help feed the stock at a steady rate across the bit, preventing pauses that can lead to burning. And that, combined with good dust collection, will give you a smooth, clean cut. The only parts left to make for the table base are the leaf stretchers. These can be made of solid stock, but the edges never get seen, so I just used a couple of pieces of oak ply. These get drilled for pocket screws on both ends to connect to the apron slides. The pocket hole jig is still set to 7 8 as before, so the screws won't interfere with the slide profile in the aprons. The locations of the leaf stretchers are carefully marked out on the back of the apron slides. The center of the aprons is carefully marked and then a line struck 10 inches to each side. This 20 inch distance between the leaf stretchers allows for the 18 inch wide leaves plus clearance for the table pins. 
clamp the leaf stretchers between the apron slides at the marks that we just made. Ensure that the assembly is square and then screw it together using the pocket screws. The stretcher gets glued and fitted between the two leg sub-assemblies and then clamped together. The ends of the apron slides will attach to the top rail of the legs. A small block of scrap plywood clamped to each corner of the base will hold the apron sub-assembly in position until it's screwed in place. A clamp across the apron ends will hold them while being positioned and prevent them from moving as the screws are applied. You'll want to verify that your assembly is square and that the apron slides are parallel from end to end. This is critical to ensure that the tops of the table will slide properly. The frame of our dining table is now complete. In episode 8, we'll build the top section of our table, including the second part of our slide mechanism, breadboard ends, and the folding leaf mechanism. So, be sure to join us for episode 8. Now, if you'd like to build this project for yourself, a complete set of plans is available for free on our homepage. It includes measured drawings, photographs, material lists, everything you need to make your own version. Woodcademy wants to thank our sponsors, whose generous support allows us to bring this show to you for free. Be sure to let them know that you appreciate it too.